This is an important video to watch if you like eating food and if you're a farmer and you're not sure whether you should join in the upcoming protests. Uh, we've really got to get farmers to understand where this is going and that farming will die if we don't do something now. The farming is being destroyed and it's being destroyed by design in order to bring in this hideous way of living that farming that really won't make anybody happy. These people are going to be, their livelihood it will be taken away from them if they don't comply. Now, don't believe a word we say in this video. Go and research it for yourself, especially if there's something that sounds implausible. Definitely research those bits. Now, we do discuss solutions towards the end of the video, so do make sure you watch those. Now, for those of you that don't know Sandy Adams, she has researched what goes on in the UN and their various agendas to a degree that I don't know anyone else that's done this depth. And she's looked at how their various agendas are being rolled out all over the world, and particularly how they are going to affect us in England. And what we're going to discuss today in particular is the impact these agendas are having on farming and also how our local councils, what they are doing, because because of these various UN agendas. Many people may be aware of the farming protests that are going on all over the EU, and this is because of these UN agendas. So in England, what specifically are the worst things that the farmers are having to face, do you know? Um, yeah, from what I can gather, it's it's money. It's um, They're being run into the ground. Farmers are under pressure. But the worst thing, that the worst pressure they're under is that they've been, uh, a man from the ministry has visited all the farms and has said, look, over the next three years, your subsidies incrementally are going to be cut unless you diversify and you stop farming meat, dairy, sheep. So sheep farming, uh, beef farming and dairy farming has to be cut. And they said that you ha will have to diversify and set up businesses on your farm, whether it's rewilding. A, a lot of farmers are doing this thing where they take schools in to, sh to teach them sustainability and diversity and whatever. They've got to diversify into yeah, anything but farming anything but farming and so it is it's a way of corporatizing farms although we are obviously not in the eu anymore what's the difference between what the eu farmers are protesting about and what is upsetting the english farmers is there an overlap because this is, seems to be a global directive or are there different points of view do you know it, it is a global agenda and this is really coming from a united nations directive and this has been going on for such a long time. Really, they want to corporatize farming and state make it state owned. Um, uh, so the idea, I mean, I, I this was flagged up to me a number of years ago, and I was given uh, a friend of mine was working for the Soil Association, and I was given a a report, and it was called the Agricultural Working Group Report for Food and Farming. Now, do look it up, and I still have it, and I'll send you a copy, Rachel, because. In that, I was absolutely shocked to the core because they were talking about how they, they wanted to revolutionise farming and turn it into a, a it turn the farms into what they called super farms, these big, huge agri-tech super farms, which we're seeing, particularly in Somerset, where I am, agri-farming has become really, really big. It's sort of agri-tech farming. Um, and so the tech is the biggest thing. It's agri-tech farming. And they've got, uh, you know, 5G collars on on cows in Somerset um, where they I mean it's horrendous these poor cows have got 5g collars on and a lot of the farmers are, are sort of really going into big big farming um, uh, that it's almost like state farming and in this group this agricultural working group report it said that farmers be paid not to farm so that they could actually set up these huge corporate farms um, which I think is the, the biggest idea. And it's all, it'll all be GMO. And it e even says, you know, it'll be focused on robotics and, um, and insect biomass. I mean, th that frightened me to death. I mean, the whole idea of insect biomass was horrendous. And it was to phase out meat farming and bring in insect biomass and using robotics more in farming. Now, this to me, it just made my blood run cold. So I, I, I put that on my uh, website. So that was a big 
big flag to me that they want to corporatize farming and take farmers away. And there was also something that said um, that farmers uh, wouldn't be able to hand down farms as they had done previously. You would have to go to university to learn how to be a farmer. So what? obviously they, That's yeah, crazy. They want, I know. They want um, farming to be learnt in a technical way. I mean, it's, it's horrendous that farming should be something that people go to university to learn how to do it. And then they set up these massive agri far you know, sort of agri tech farming, uh, which is, you know, undercover GMO, uh, LED lights, you know, everything sort of very efficient and very uh, nothing natural, nothing natural. No, at all. A, fr a friend of mine is in uh, northern Indiana and he was saying, he said, you can drive for hundreds of miles and all you see is soy and corn growing. And he yeah. said they are farming it with drones. The drones yeah. go over with the chemicals. And he said, you know, where are the farmers? And it's all and he he was talking about he said it's all done GPS. And I guess I don't know yeah. if they've got 5G in, in northern Indiana, but it, it's all done with all this tech. This is this is really Franken farming. This is horrible. This is not this is not natural. It's not what the body needs. It's not what we need as human beings. You know what? It, you know this is this is so wrong, and I can't believe that any farmer would agree with this. You know, uh, we've really got to get farmers to understand where this is going, and that farming will die if we don't do something now. If we don't alert people to this horrendous thing that's that they're trying to do um you know the very fact that they want to hand farming over to someone like sainsbury's i mean sainsbury's future of food document which i will try and dig out it was frightening that sainsbury's want to start producing a lot of the yeah. market want to start producing their own food and it's all undercover it's gmo it's hideous it is not going to be healthy and then we've got the absolute zero document that a lot of the uh farmers don't haven't seen or don't you know don't know about uh that where all the shipping in and out and and the the imports and exports from europe um for for europe will be will be stopped by 2030 so particularly England anyway, um, the absolute zero document really pertains to England, where by 2030 in their roadmap, and it's a big sort of colour coded roadmap of what's going to happen by 2030, is that we will have no imports or exports in or out of the UK by 2030 by air or ship. How are we going to feed ourselves if we're not growing anything? And yes, this, this is what really I, I had to read those documents myself because I wasn't just going to believe you. I, I downloaded them and I read them and that really put me into deep level of shock because yes. all these random events and things that don't make sense, when you know what the end goal is, everything makes sense and you start to view the world in a very different way. I, I, I can't believe it myself. I mean, I think we've really got to get our, our act together and we need to look for a human future of farming, being able to treat human beings and the animals well. Um, and this agri-tech farming does neither. Um, in fact, they don't even want animals farmed. They want us to live on, as, as I said, insect biomass and soya, which we know is really bad for human beings. Soya is a very bad crop. And maize, I mean, I've noticed it in Somerset, all the maize fields are waterlogged in Somerset. And a lot of farmers are being encouraged to grow maize and it's not doing the soil any good whatsoever. No, yeah. and all the machine, the size of the sheer size of the machinery for this yeah. style of big agriculture, it it just compacts the soil. All the chemicals that they're using, it destroys every all the life in it. And you've only got to look back at pictures of people, even in the eighties. Uh, you know, you go back to the fifties, sixties, seventies, and it, it, you can see the health of people's body. There's very little obesity, mm -hmm. but now you can see what. Well, I suppose there's that saying that uh, humans are the only species intelligent enough to create artificial food and the only species dumb enough to eat it. You can see what it's done to us. It's not well, it, good it to make it worse. 
It's the crazy. Can't process it, can it? You know, this no. is why we've got obesity because the body doesn't know what to do with the stuff that's being put into it, and it lays on fat because it doesn't, it can't process it at all. The more processed stuff we eat, the worse our health becomes. So it has to be, it has to be done in in a way that farmers can still make money. Because um, obviously farmers say, oh, well, I would go organic, but I can't afford it. So all of the solar panels, and as you know, I've done a lot of research. We've gone to our local council talking about them. And it's horrible when you realise the production and the fact that they become toxic waste when because of all the, the components of them. So recycling them is is difficult. And you so one bad hailstorm and they're covering our farmland with it. And you read the Absolute Zero report and you think, well, hang on a minute, you're covering our farmland in solar panels and we're not going to be able to import food. You know, you mm. don't need a degree in anything to see that that's not going to go well. So, you know, this is being pushed on farmers. They are given more money if they put their land either over to rewilding or to solar. So can mm. you talk about how... The, the councils themselves are complicit with all of this, with what they are rolling out and the permissions that they are being forced to give by the government. What's the, can you do sort of talk about the knock on effect? We've talked about the UN, then the government then rolls it out further and then the councils, their involvement. Mm. Well, this was always Agenda 21 and 2030. Agenda 21 was really brought into being at the Earth Summit in 1992. And it was always going to be brought from global to local and, and almost brought back again to global because once you've captured the local and it was brought into every town council uh, in, in the UK um, under something called um, ICLE, which is the International uh, Committee for Environmental and Local Initiatives. Um, and do look that up. That was created at the Earth Summit to, to bring the agenda from the, the global arena into the local arena so that actually it would be in it's almost like infiltrating the councils with the green agenda and this was always how it was going to be and I would always ask people to read Rosa Corrie's book Behind the Green Mask she explains this so beautifully it really is about how the, the local councils were infiltrated and how they're doing this now they've decided to create climate emergencies to just declare them with no recourse it's just we are declaring and you will find that every town council in England has declared a climate emergency under the basis of what no science, no evidence of any sort, which is why we're, we're challenging the councils now. Well done for you for challenging Colchester. Yes, they've, they've confirmed it. They they haven't given the uh, councillors any information at all. They've mm. just said, oh, the IPCC says, and that they don't, they haven't declared it. So, yeah, we've got it in writing. The IPCC, they haven't. Yeah, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was again created at the Earth Summit by Maurice Strong and all the, the, bill, the global billionaires that created the Earth Summit. They were oil billionaires. They'd already invested in carbon, carbon credit banks before they even started the Earth Summit. It's their way of corporatizing the entire planet. That's what they decided to do. These are businessmen, billionaires, who have organized this. And I can't stress enough how this was a plan from the get-go to make more billionaires richer and to corporatize the entire planet and to capture it so that we literally are, um, we're, we're like cattle and they, they, they corporatize and monetize the whole of nature, the whole of the resources of our planet. This is how they were gonna do it. Um, and so they brought it to the local areas, you know, and now what we're dealing with now is the fallout of all that because we're, we've woken up and our councils haven't. They're completely brainwashed. They brought in the climate, um, as we know, the climate literacy training to further embed this ideology within our councils and the climate literacy training, as you as you know, and, and thank goodness for um, your your work on that with um with David is that the you know it's 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 a psychological brainwashing operation actually it's awful the way that they use it to infiltrate the councils and then the councils have to take this training and then pass it on to to the people of you know of the town or the city or whatever 
wherever it's being rolled out. If you're wondering what she's referring to, we had a behavioural psychologist go through the carbon literacy training that's being rolled out to counsellors and he confirmed how manipulative it was. Uh, we covered that in our video, Vexing CO2. It's the second speech that Karina gave, if you'd like to learn more details. The thing is that... Our council, if you, I mean, I've, I've only been looking at my Somerset County Council at the moment and North Somerset, and um, there's no food security provision at all in any of their documents. They've put out something called the our, our corporate plan. Our corporate plan. Now there's, there you go. Please <laughs> uh, the name. Actually, yeah. <laughs> um, so they, I looked at their their website and they, here's our corporate plan, and it is all about it's all about renewables. It's about housing. It's about um, uh, wind farms, it's about uh, photovoltaics, it's about walking and cycling and uh, children going to learn about sustainability, grown-ups learning sustainability. It has got absolutely nothing, nothing. All these budgets are going to all these different things. Nothing about food security. Nothing. No. It's, it's a North Somerset yeah, mapping of all their planning Um how they how they see the future of North Somerset land. So all of the areas in red, yellow and orange, that is all going to be over to renewables, wind farms. I mean, it, it's actually all of the agricultural land between now and I think it's 2028, which would be a disaster, you know, it's a, an absolute disaster. It's just criminal covering land like this in wind farms. I'm afraid you can no longer view this map because since Sandy started discussing it in public, they've taken it off their website. We've had uh, some of our councillors, although some have left now, but they had a farming background and I've watched them in the planning meetings desperately trying to stop solar farms being rolled out on good quality that could be farmed. And they tried their best to stop it. And basically the planning officers almost held a gun to the head and say you've got no reason you cannot pass this and of course if a planning application goes to appeal and they lose it costs the council money um so the councillors are in a very difficult position because you know they've got a good head on their shoulders they know about sustainability for food supply being farmers and they raised this and it was just rejected because of the climate emergency and that's the problem with any of these so-called emergencies you do things in because it's an emergency allegedly and there's no emergency i mean this is like it's like alice in wonderland you know it's off with their heads you know there's no emergency as we know the the level of co2 is 0. 0. 0.0 it's, it's 400 parts per million it's not a problem and if no. it goes much lower then things don't grow. I mean, to be honest, you know, people don't realise that, um, and it's all been it's all been based on 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 hearsay from fake science, and you know, it's been pushed by the BBC. Everybody's been brainwashed. So if it's on the BBC, it must be true, and unfortunately, this is this is where we're finding that people. I mean, I'm finding a lot of people waking up to the lie now. And I mean, it's not physically possible. The work of Professor William Happer from Princeton University yeah. shows that, that its capacity to affect temperature is inversely logarithmic. The first 200 parts per million make the biggest impact. Dr Happer quantified this by saying that increasing CO2 from 400 to 800 parts per million will only increase the heat that gets returned to the surface by less than 1%. Even after we had in Glastonbury, we had the great net zero debate, which didn't end up being a debate because they didn't turn up to a debate. They they wouldn't answer us. We had four months to try and defend their climate emergency and they couldn't. People have to find their own way and they do. And you've just um, given them the evidence. I mean, Ralph's talk was incredible. It was such a good talk yeah. to open with and showing, you know, to have a boat. Because, you know, Karina and I stand up and say our bit, but that's nothing compared to having a proper bona fide climate scientist turn up and tell you and point yeah. out to the graphs exactly. yeah. that look and show you. I mean, I don't have any scientific degree, so I feel I can't really, you know, it's not sort of thing I could do. But there's so many people that do and they do it well. And, you know, you've got a better understanding of it than me, to be honest, or of the science. I just know what I know. And I know that I've I've asked, you know, sort of people with with astrophysics degrees and things like that. 
So I just think, well, what we need to do is really get the, you know, we have got a lot of scientists on board now, masses of them who understand what's going on. Um, and that most people that go along with it are paid to do so. I mean, that's the problem. Mm. And that's the problem all round, really, isn't it? It's it's the bribery that goes on in order to push a narrative. And it's, yeah, it's corrupt. So those of you who are convinced that the minuscule amounts of CO2 that humans make is causing global warming, please can you evidence that? Prove it. And prove it with full chart data, not the cherry pick data that you see in the IPCC reports and not the computer models that are way off. Sometimes the temperatures are up to three times higher than the actual. No one is denying the climate is changing. It has done since time began. But to put such a complex mechanism of climate down to one tiny thing that humans produce is bonkers. So do your research. Absolutely prove it. Our local council couldn't, and if you'd like to read the email stream that went on over nine months, just go to the Dropbox resources folder and look under email number two. And there's some very useful links to very interesting information. So let's swim back to the farmers. What can they do? Now, my, my answer to that would be carry on doing what you're doing and just sell to the public to cut out the supermarkets. Yes, I, I think so. And also, you know, the, what the government should be doing is helping farmers wean them off the chemicals with get, yes. get them subsidies so they can do natural farming. I saw a video on Twitter the other day where the farmer was saying, you want us to be natural, but yet we're not allowed to store the manure in case the runoff gets into the water. And yet, yet you will happily pump sewage into the sea, yet you're yeah. penalising the farmers. And the yeah. thing is, whatever people's views are on eating cows, cow manure is one of the most beneficial things for the soil Absolutely. you can get. So if we want to set up a regenerative agriculture um, model, which I'm all for, um, you need that cattle. You've got to have that whole circle. I mean, nature is so intelligent with everything that it does and those sort of billions of, of microorganisms that are in just a teaspoon of soil, that whole food wide web that is in nature has got it absolutely perfect. And then man comes along and tips chemicals and ruins everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's what we should be doing. Um, and also community farms as well. Mm -hmm. If the farmers don't want to be doing all of this, I think selling land to the community <laughs> or renting it out or putting it in a trust so that we can do it. And I think the community very much needs to be on board with the farmers and help them set up those mm. farm shops. Um, because it's one thing knowing about the fields and all, everything you have to do to be a farmer, but then to have to be a businessman and then turn or woman and turn that into a shop, that's a whole different skill set that they're stretching the farmers. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw any of Clarkson's farm, but um, I saw a bit of that and the paperwork they make them go through, the oh, hoops they have to no, get through just to get their subsidies. It wears them down. It wears them down. I mean, all of this is wearing farmers down. And I mean, it's really sad. The average age of a farmer um, is, is 65 to 85 years old. Young people aren't coming into farming. They see they see what's you know what what they're going through, and they think that's not for me. I'll go and work in the city. You know this is this is a trouble. There's um you know we need a whole new breed of young farmers to understand that if we don't preserve this this very very sacred part of our lives, you know it's a, it's it's the whole nature cycle. And if you have good farms, you have good food. And you have healthy people. That whole we are part of nature thing, having mm. food grown in really sterile environments, we need certain bacteria in our system. And we would get that from foraging in our natural environment. And there's something about daylight, proper actual sunlight, rather than growing in artificial sun, light. Sun we need to be yeah. in nature and experiencing it. This whole sterilised artificialness is not going to do us any good. But you try getting that through to people that are programmed on, we've got to save the planet by growing everything mm. undercover in warehouses yeah. with solar panels on the roof <laughs> and all being grown by robots. I mean, there, there's, there's, mm. um, I've seen online, I don't know where it was, probably China, where they've 
got vast warehouses and it's robots picking insects off and and going round and it's just like that's this, this not is what, food. this is what they want they want robotic farming and you know this is the future this is the the chinese model is is their model and we have to look at that and think do we really want a communist future like that because that's exactly what it is you know it's it's like forcing this 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 awful way of robotic farming digital id surveillance all of that stuff data harvesting um all on us you know this is a, this is a part of a much bigger picture and you know we really have to stand up and understand what's happening to us um, and you did ask me earlier, what's what's the difference between the way they're treating Europe with farming and the way they're treating us? Well, the thing is that, for instance, for the farmers in Holland, it was about the fertilizer, start telling them they couldn't use the fertilizer, which they'd use. And I understand that some fertilizers aren't good because then they're, they're not the, the land isn't regenerating itself and putting stuff in. But they they used that and they did it overnight, which I thought was interesting because it did cause a backlash. Suddenly the farmers overnight said, no, we've got to protest about this. In, in England, they're doing incrementally. It's over th this three year period. And they know that if the British farmers get up and fight, then they've lost it. Yes. This is why we have to do it. So, yes, it's absolutely critical that the farmers here do rise up and there's, there's rumblings that it could happen, um, very positive ones. But what's very important is the public understand why they're doing it and support them so that they know that whatever, because certainly in France they have, I don't know what they would do in England, I can't imagine it would be quite like they have demonstrated in Europe, but you know, if roads are shut off and it's inconvenient and there's suddenly no food in the supermarkets, that gives people a taster of what it would be like without the farmers not having food in the supermarkets. So um, getting behind them is obviously very important. You know that farmers are salt of the earth. Busy lives as well. They don't have time to be doing all of this stuff. They wouldn't be kicking off unless it's absolutely vital that they do so. And I know some farmers are concerned about that, that the public opinion, they don't, they don't, no one wants to be a nuisance. No one really wants to complain. But the stakes are so high here. And when you know, like we do about the UN agendas, and you know this is being orchestrated to be a land grab, that puts a different spin on it. Certainly mm. my views before 2020 and probably a lot of people's were government were, you know, people that work in government, they're a bit greedy, but they're very, a bit incompetent. You don't believe there's anything worse happening. Um, but when you see all these agendas, you think, OK, they're probably not as incompetent as I thought they were. They're actually following or doing as they're told, basically. So, yeah, um, yeah it's critical that we support the farmers here and understand it. But what would you say to people to sort of get that message across a bit more, whether it's a farmer that's not sure whether they should join in? And what would you say to that? If you can if you can see further you know the, the next day if you like you, you know it's about looking looking towards a future where farming is actually will become a, the most amazing industry again uh, it's been I think a lot has been taken away from our farmers and if they can see that they can, they do have a future a good future um, and that the people you know I, I did talk to a Somerset farmer this morning and he had an idea you know he was trying to rally rally a few people to to actually take action and a lot of them said we don't want to upset the British public well they they could serve the British public so well if they actually did that you know did take action because at the moment the farming is being destroyed and it's being destroyed by design in order to bring in this hideous way of living that you know and farming that really won't make anybody happy um, and all the proceeds will be siphoned off. The people will never see the proceeds of this and neither will the farmers. So if they really want to get on board with proper farming for people and because otherwise we'll end up with no farms, no food. And that's, and that's exactly a lot more happens. upsetting to the general public yeah. than no you know, farmers, a few no days food. or weeks of protesting. Yeah. And I'm sure most people would, would rather have decent farmers markets and decent farmers shops and cut out these wretched supermarkets who are fitted with biometrics to data surveil you and, and to, 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 to lock you out if they so wish. And that's what will happen. Because if the CBDCs come in, 
the facial recognition will lock you out of opening those cabinets in your supermarket. Now, this is probably going a step too far if you don't have a good social credit and if you don't come up to scratch in their in their sort of weird world of surveillance. And, yes, because uh, they want to carbon and, tax us, don't carbon, they? So if you carbon, if you had too much tax. meat that week, you know. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So you'd be better off going to a proper farmer who's creating proper food and buying it from there and cutting out these monstrous supermarkets who are going along with the whole corporate plan. Yeah. Yes, there's a website, I think it's called Big Barn. I'll put the link in the description where yeah. this is how I found all the, the when I moved here, I found all the local farmers, um, but also farm shops. And just up the road in Wormingford, we've got this wonderful farm and it's a small, they rent their tenant farmers and they've got raw milk. Uh, unfortunately, the yeah. neighbours complain, so they're not allowed to sell other people's vegetables. They're only allowed to sell things that they produce. But, you know, yeah. they've got all of their, you know, the cattle is beautiful as you drive past. You can yeah. see it's well looked after. Um, their son uh, raises the chickens for the eggs. He's six. So my egg supplier is a six year old. That's and lovely. we might be seven by now. But anyway, so it is a lovely family business. And you think, yes, I'm going to support them through thick and thin. And I make sure that I know it's inconvenient not going to soup. Well, I don't actually. I haven't been to a supermarket in years. I only go into the co-op when I need some um, distilled vinegar to clean out my, my water distiller. That's the only thing I buy. Everything else either comes from Abel and Cole or Riverfords. And yeah. uh, oh, I was talking of Riverford, uh, Guy Watson, he put forward to Parliament, didn't he, recently, about he wanted fair pay for farmers because dealing with the supermarkets... Um, they put them on, I think it's 180 or nine, certainly 90 days credit, if not 180. And farmers, they wanted them to one, stick to their contracts, two, pay them on time. And I forget what the third thing was. It was perfectly reasonable. And it got kicked out because they said, oh, no, that would be inflationary. And you think, come on. But when you see people like Sainsbury's have um, Ram Ram got a vested interest in getting shot of the farmers, but yeah. you know my family business, uh, we supplied you know Sainsbury's and Tesco with plants, and oh my word, it was dreadful dealing with them. You had to contribute towards their advertising costs. You had yeah. to pay to be in a certain area of the store, or if they had realised they couldn't sell stuff, if there was a speck of dust on the pot the whole shipment would be sent back or hostas yeah. didn't come up through the centre of the plant. So in the end, my parents, they opened up a retail business and told the supermarkets where to shove it. Yeah, and it was much easier. Yeah. yeah, we cut out the middleman and our tagline was buy direct from the grower. And it's that's perfect. what that's what we need to do. And it's, everyone's happier to cut yes. out the middleman because they're just, they're reaping massive profits and none of those profits are plowed back into anything other than their banks. So we've so, got to do that with farming. And, you know, I just may I put it into my week that, yes, OK, I have to get in the car and go and get my eggs and beef. But I've got a friend that lives near there and we go for a dog walk. Uh, so we make it part of the my life now is uh, okay. supporting that farm shop through thick yeah. and thin. And if Excellent. everybody does that and shows the farmers the support and the produce yeah. is so much better because it hasn't been kicking around it hasn't been stored goodness knows how exactly, and... exactly. you don't want vegetables that have been stored for, for months on end or you know or flown halfway across the world I mean that's no. the other thing you know yeah we've lost Let's... the diversity in farming exactly. they have it in Europe much better certainly France yeah. and Spain um, yeah. but here it's it is fields of one is monocropping and yeah. getting back to more sort of traditional ways of farming. But of course, mm -hmm. all the farmers have these gigantic tractors and machinery that just compacts the soil. So then it is creating more problems. So, mm -hmm. yeah, farming is in a very bad state. But if we don't support but it, the it farmers... Need, it can recover. It just yes. needs a, a different mindset. Absolutely. Um, quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. So I hope this inspires people to support the farmers, whatever happens. And also, I think I'll probably do videos on my other channel, the gardening channel, uh, because what I think we need to be doing is community farms as well, because I know a lot of farmers and I don't blame them. will just throw the towel in. So we need to pick up that because certainly um, in Russia, their food supply is grown by the Dachers and they're basically home gardeners. Now they have bigger gardens there than we do here. They're about 600 square metres, so 20 by 30 metres. And they grow about 80% of the food supply. It's not the farmers. 
And I think we need to kind of start doing that again, even though I don't know if you've seen the articles where they're trying to persuade us that growing fruits and vegetables is bad for the planet. And you think, oh, come on now. Come on. I mean, they'll try anything at the moment. I, mean, I know. It, it is quite hilarious. That. I mean, I just don't understand. Uh, yeah. How, how you could ever say that that growing fruit tree is not, you know, is somehow making the planet die. I mean, what are, are they crazy? This is madness. And we've got to look beyond this madness. You know, they're putting every trying to push everything onto electric. If we had a Carrington event tomorrow, which look that up as well, it, we're pretty due for because the Earth's magnetic field is weakening. And, you know, if, if we had a Carrington event, which would knock out the grid, what would we do if we were on all electric? Then everything literally goes out and then we, we, we have nothing. That's why they're trying to take our wood burners away, our gas boilers, our gas, you know, everything that, that we will keep us, you know, in, in a sort of an autonomous way, other than electric, of, 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 of working, particularly wood burners and, and, uh, and argers and things like that. You know, we've, we've got to work very, very closely and understand that... Our, our autonomy is everything. Our autonomy, our, our a ability to grow our own food and to, uh, and to keep ourselves warm and to create our own, uh, you know, shelter, you know, to have a roof over our heads is so important. And Agenda 2030 seeks to really take most of that away, particularly private property and private home ownership. So we've got to be very careful. And um, yes, yes I'm probably well, well I've heard someone I don't know who to attribute this quote for, but it was something like um, we're free range humans living on a tax farm. Only these days yeah. we're a bit less free range. <laughs> I, th I would add to that and say they seem to be turning us over to the battery farming um, yes. model. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, we're everything's commoditized. Um, and yeah, it, it's we've got to push back against it because there's more of us than them and That's embrace true. the. The best of the technology, because it can be useful, but also those old ways and the old wisdom and get back to manageable farms and things. And I think, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Michael Tellinger's work with One Small Town, that idea where everyone volunteers three hours a week. When you've got a free labour force all working for a common goal, then yeah. you can achieve amazing well, things. I mean, I, I have to say, and I, I have spoken to Tellinger about this, um, is unfortunately his one small town model is using smart contracts. It's using, um, it, it, it's buying into the centralized system that we literally do not want to get involved in. And I've pointed that out and I'm, I was quite pleased to hear that I think Stroud have decided that they're doing their own thing, which is actually decentralized. It's Tellinger's system, but yes. it's decentralized. I think it's called One, uh, one Free Town, um, yes. but not Even using better smart contracts, QR codes, um, and all the stuff that, um, uh, you know, Tellinger really wants, wanted it. I mean, he, he took Ubuntu and unfortunately corporatized it. And that really didn't go down well. But the idea is good. The idea yes, is good. I like the idea. I, I agree with the smart codes and, and things, uh, QR codes. Yeah. I, I was a bit concerned about that. But then you think, well, you know, we've got this technology. We could use it for and good. And also but we yes. have to be careful of tokenization because only that could... That is something that is is being used on the blockchain. Is, is humans being tokenized? Oh, and tokenization isn't a good idea. But actually, if you decentralize it and use it as your own system in your own town, then I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's just good old fashioned community. Yeah. It's how yeah. tribes always function, but we've evolved exactly. a bit past yeah. that. Yeah. Looking after to one another. Back to that. You know, we need to get back to that and have, you know, this this all all of this happened when. Really, you know, Europe, all the borders, they wanted a borderless Europe and all this. Sort of, no, we need our national sovereignty and we need our, our, our villages and with their own little customs. And, and if you take that to the bright wider point, it's your country with its own customs and its own food supply. We need to have that that whole thing of sovereignty, whether it's personal sovereignty, bodily autonomy, whether it's sovereignty within your community or whether it's sovereignty within your nation. We need it. And we don't want to be a universal, like one big, and this is what it's all about. It's one world government. And that's partly what the European Union was, was sent to do. Most farmers gave up farming when it was taken over by the EU because of all the rules and regulations. All of that destroyed our farming, I believe.
it destroyed our fish industry. It destroyed our, our dairy industry. It destroyed everything. We need to go back and, and actually have our proper farms back. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It needs to be people and planet before profit and politics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Sandy. Much appreciated. And yeah, we've, we've got to get, please share this video far and wide because it's very important that the public know this isn't just farmer drama kicking off. There's a really yeah. good reason for the farmers to take to the streets in their tractors when they're busy people. You know, they're not yeah, just doing it for busy. fun. Thanks, Rachel. It's been lovely. So in this video, we barely scratched the surface of the delights that they have in store for us. I've done a few more in the 15 minute nonsense video, which I recommend you also watch. But even that only just scratches the surface of the utter delights that are coming our way if more and more people don't start to see this and don't say no. So research these things yourselves and come to your own conclusions. But spoiler alert, it's not good. Right now, we collectively are staring down the barrel of a gun. Well, those of us with our eyes open are. A lot of the population is gripping their eyes tightly shut, not wanting to see it. And yes, that's an option. But regardless of whether you open your eyes or not, that gun is still pointed at us. And what's worse, it's our fingers that are pulling the trigger by following the orders and instructions of the powers that shouldn't be. So we all need to stop doing that and start looking out for one another. So those of you in any form of government, be it central or local, you are complicit in this if you keep going along with it. And yes, we know you are bound by your rules and regulations, but unless you are putting food security into your local plans or whichever plan it has to go on, then you are complicit and you and your family have to eat food as well, do you not? So it's in everybody's interest that we work together. So we do need to take action now, peaceful action, but action nonetheless. The whole English keep calm and carry on will be our downfall. Keeping calm, yes, absolutely. Keeping peaceful, 100%. But carrying on, no. We have to make change and we have to be the ones that do it. And we have to do it before the digital IDs and digital currencies come in, because when they do, it'll be pretty much game over and much harder. Right now, we have a window of opportunity that we must take. For those that like the idea of community farming, I strongly recommend you watch a wonderful movie documentary called The Biggest Little Farm. That shows you what it's like if you've got absolutely no farming experience to then go to create an organic, regenerative farm You'll get a big dose of realism in it, but at the same time, it is very inspiring to watch.